today, I'm going to show you how to ethically train your partner to do more of the stuff that you want them to do in your relationship. Now, I know you might be thinking, Nate, this is really derogatory and demeaning. I don't know why you're asking me to do this. I totally get it. And I just want you to give me the benefit of the doubt for like a couple seconds while I explain myself. I promise you I'm not using the word training in a negative way. I don't want you to treat your partner like a monkey or a dog or a horse. That is not what I'm asking you to do here. All I'm asking you to do is just be conscious about how you're influencing them. And I want to start off by telling you a story. Muke the gorilla lives at the Cincinnati Zoo. And a while back, she grabbed a giant dirt clod that was sitting in her enclosure and threw it up at the people on the other side of the fence that were watching her. When Muke did this, she got a big reaction. Some people laughed and clapped. Some people screamed and ran away. And Muke loved the reaction that she got. So she grabbed another chunk of grass and hurled it up over the enclosure wall and got another big reaction. She learned really quick that all she had to do to entertain herself was grab a chunk of sod and throw it over the fence and she'd get a show. Now, over the next few weeks, Muke's aim got really good and they actually had to station zoo attendants around the enclosure to warn people about incoming gorilla projectiles. The lesson that we can get from Muke the dirt clod thrower is one of the most impactful and transformative relationship lessons that I can teach you. It can be the thing that gets you unstuck when you feel like nothing is working. It can help you get your needs met when you're feeling depleted. And it will help you feel less frustrated with your spouse and help you feel like they're on your same team and even grateful for all the things that they do to make your life better. Now let's talk about the actual lesson. I recently read this amazing book called What Shamu Taught Me About Life, Love, and Marriage by Amy Sutherland. When Amy started writing this book, she thought it was going to be a book about animal training. So she was out studying some of the top animal trainers in the world at the San Diego Zoo and at SeaWorld and all these other places where they train animals to do incredible things. And as she was learning, she started to think, I wonder if these principles that I'm learning about how to train animals would work on my husband. Now, if you want to know how that turned out, you should definitely go read her book. But in the next few minutes, I want to take some of the nuggets of information that really impacted me and share them with you and how they relate back to Muke. The first rule that the animal trainers taught her is that every interaction with an animal is training, whether you mean it to be training or not. For example, if you only ever let your dog back in the house after it's barked at the back door for a few minutes, you're teaching it that whenever it wants something, it just has to bark. Or when you feed a wild bear food, you're teaching it, it doesn't have to forage or hunt for food, it just has to approach humans and the humans will give it food. Or if you laugh, scream, clap, or run in terror after a gorilla throws a dirt clod over the fence, you're teaching it all it needs to do when it's bored for a little entertainment is to chuck a hunk of grass at some people. In every interaction with every one of these animals, we're incentivizing action. We're training it to do something, whether we mean to or not. Another thing I learned about animal trainers is that they don't rely on luck or chance to teach a dolphin to jump through a hoop or a dog to roll over. There's actually a lot of intention that goes into these teaching moments. The trainers know that it's their responsibility to do everything within their power to set the animal up for success. It's up to them to understand the animal better than the animal understands itself. They need to be aware of when the animal's in a bad mood, what might distract the animal from being present during a training session, and they need to know how to get them re-engaged during an activity if they do get distracted. And the very best animal trainers, they know they have to become masters of controlling their body language and their facial expressions and their tone of voice, and especially how they respond to the animals that they're training. They know that if they are reactive or distracted or focused on the wrong thing, they can accidentally train the animal to do the wrong behavior. Here's an example. There was a couple who had this dog that loved sitting on the couch and they wanted to train the dog to get off the couch. So the dog would get on the couch and then they would get it off the couch and they would give it a treat to reward the behavior of getting off the couch. Then one day, this woman woke up and she started cooking breakfast and the dog walks in the kitchen, makes eye contact with the woman, walks over to the couch, jumps up on the cushion and then down off the cushion and looks at her expecting a reward. She realized we didn't train our dog to get off the couch. We actually trained our dog to get on the couch and then off the couch. That has to be so frustrating as a trainer. Another trick of the trade, if you want to be a really great animal trainer, is to learn to reward anything that resembles the type of behavior that you want out of the animal that you're training and then ignore everything else. So if you're trying to train a really skittish and cautious bird to perch on your finger and eat out of your hand, the first day in the cage with the bird, you might reward it for just coming a little bit close to you. 
And then the next day when you go in the cage with the bird, if it comes even closer, you're rewarded again. And then after a while, maybe you hold out your hand and it pecks a little bird seed out of your hand and flies away. You keep rewarding that bird until it gets comfortable sitting on the perch of your finger. And then that bird learns to associate standing on your finger with the reward that it wants. Now, if an animal doesn't do what the trainer wants it to do, if the animal's distracted or unmotivated or not feeling well, maybe it's having an off day, the trainer doesn't take that personally. They don't assume that the animal has some sort of hidden agenda to sabotage their training plan or that the animal hates them. As a matter of fact, one of the cardinal rules that animal trainers live by is that it's never the animal's fault. Take just a moment and think about Muke the dirt clod throwing gorilla. If the humans outside of Muke's enclosure just completely stopped reacting to her dirt clod throwing, she'd probably get bored with it and go find something else to entertain herself. Okay, now that you've had a little crash course in animal training, I want you to do something a little weird. I want you to think of your partner as if they were an animal, and I want you to think of yourself as the animal trainer. I just want you to consider what if every interaction that you had with your partner was an opportunity to influence or train them? Because honestly, we do this all the time. We are always either consciously or unconsciously incentivizing the behaviors of the people around us. Think about it this way. Every smile, every kiss, every compliment, every disagreement is a moment where you are influencing your partner. You're giving them information. This is behavior that I like or it's behavior that I don't like. This is something I want more of or this is something I want less of. So what do you think would happen if you took 100% responsibility for the signals that you send to your partner? What if you took responsibility for your body language, your facial expressions, your tone of voice, the words that you use, the way that you express your emotions? What if you took responsibility for knowing your partner better than they know themselves so you could tell when they were in a position to have a tough conversation or not? What if you rewarded them every time they did something that made you happy or brought joy to your life? Do you think that could change the dynamic of your relationship a little bit? Do you think they might adjust their behavior? The answer is yes, absolutely, 100%. And that's exactly what training is. It's simply adjusting the environment and offering incentives and rewards for the behavior that you want more of. If you really wrap your mind around this lesson that we're getting from a dirt clod throwing gorilla, this can become your superpower in life and especially in marriage. You can absolutely influence and incentivize and even change the behavior of your partner, but only, only by changing yourself first. As you begin to gain mastery and control over the negative feelings that you feel when your partner lets you down or when you're hurt or disappointed, or the body language and tone of voice that you use when you're talking to your partner and you might be feeling a little hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. As you shift your mindset and start to find ways to express gratitude and appreciation, for the efforts that your partner puts in to make you happy, it will completely change the dynamic of your relationship. So here's something you can do right now. Grab a piece of paper and a pen or take out your phone and make a list of some of your biggest points of frustration in your relationship right now. Think about some of the areas where your partner is consistently getting angry, irritated, and upset with you and just get them listed out. Now, it's really easy to get hyper-focused on the behavior that frustrates us about our partner. We get ticked off that they just won't manage the budget. We get frustrated that they won't help us around the house. We get upset or annoyed that they won't pick up their dirty laundry, shut the cupboard doors, or empty the dishwasher when the dishes are clean. And we spend so much time and energy being upset about the ways that our partner is letting us down that we don't stop to ask the important question. Why are they behaving this way? Sometimes the answer is just that it's part of their nature. Just like bats are nocturnal, lions are carnivores, and bears are hibernators, your partner might just simply be more cluttery than you by nature. But nature is not responsible for all of our relationship conflicts. The other reason that our partners might misbehave is that maybe there's a possibility that we've been incentivizing that bad behavior. We've trained them to misbehave. The reason an animal trainer can teach a dolphin to do a backflip or a monkey to ride a skateboard or an elephant to pee on command is that they've spent a lot of time and energy incentivizing these little behaviors that result in this cool trick being done. And your partner really isn't much different. Here's an example. A while back during the holidays, I was talking to a woman who was just miserable in her marriage. She was so ticked off at her husband. She told me he's completely checked out of our relationship. He won't communicate. He's emotionally shut off. He's being selfish. 
The final straw for her was that she desperately wanted to spend time with her family over Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was a big deal for them. They had all these really great traditions and she was just so excited to go hang out with her people. So Thanksgiving came around, they showed up at her family's house and after about 30 minutes of being there, he's like, okay, we gotta go. She ended up refusing to get in the car and stayed with her family and then he went to his family's house for the rest of Thanksgiving. She was obviously really hurt by this. And so I started asking her some questions. And one of those questions was, do your parents know that you guys are having marriage problems? And she goes, oh yeah, I tell my parents everything. So I said, oh, okay. So out of curiosity, how do you think it is for him when he goes to your parents' house and he knows that they know that you guys are having some pretty big marriage problems and everybody in that house believes that he's responsible for those problems, that he's a bad husband, a bad father, that he's treating you, their daughter or their sister or their cousin or granddaughter so poorly. And as I said that, it was like a switch flipped. All the color just drained from her face and she was like, oh my gosh, yeah, no wonder he doesn't want to spend time there. I wouldn't want to if I was in his position. She realized in that moment that by complaining about her husband to her parents, she was actually training her husband to not give her the thing that she wanted, which was more time with her family. And the more he resisted spending time with her family, the more she would complain to them about what a crappy husband he was. And it would just exacerbate the problem and created this really terrible negative cycle. Here's another example from my own marriage. Early on in our marriage, I sat down in front of the TV and I was folding this giant mountain of laundry. And my wife came in the room and I said, hey babe, is there a special way that you want me to fold your shirts? And she was like, no Nate, I just appreciate that you're folding them, thanks. And she left. A few minutes later, she came back in the room and sat next to me on the couch. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye that she was subtly taking some of the shirts that I had folded off the pile and unfolding them and then refolding them this special way that she wanted them done. So I looked at her and I said, oh, did I fold your shirt wrong? And she looked back at me and goes, uh, it was just a little sloppily done and I was just redoing it so it could be better. And we'll just say, I'm not necessarily proud of how I responded. I got a little short tempered and huffy with her and I was like, fine, you can fold your own shirts from now on. I'm never folding them again. And I grabbed her pile of clothes and just plopped it on her lap. And that was the moment that my wife realized that she had trained me to not fold her laundry. Now, since all that happened, we've had a conversation about it. And now I am once again, an active participant in all of the laundry folding responsibilities. But I think these stories are important examples of ways that we actually incentivize the behavior that we don't want. Think about it from an animal trainer's perspective for just a minute. Kicking the dog when it doesn't sit on command doesn't get the dog excited to sit for you in the future. It just makes the dog scared of you and less likely to trust you. So think about it for a minute. When your partner doesn't do the thing that you want, how do you respond to them? Do you metaphorically kick them by nagging, complaining, or harping on them? Do you whine, gossip, humiliate, or punish them? Do you yell at them, manipulate them, or berate them? Or maybe you punish them with isolation. You withdraw your love and affection and your presence from them. All of these behaviors are analogous to kicking the dog. Not to mention the research shows that both people and animals grow numb over time to punishments. So in order for your punishment to get you the behavior that you want, your punishments have to become more and more severe over time. Punishing your partner might get you a response, but eventually these behaviors are just gonna make your partner resent you, fear you, and maybe even hate you over the long term. And I know you don't want that. So the big question that I have for you is what could you do to get your partner excited to do the thing that they are resisting? You could start by rewarding anything that even remotely resembles progress with something like a kiss, a word of thanks, or a smile. And when they make big progress, you can give them a bigger reward, like a nice steak dinner, or a bouquet of roses, or maybe a full body massage. Here's a couple simple examples. If your partner runs the other direction whenever they hear the words, we need to talk. Well, it's probably because every time they hear those words, it's immediately followed by a list of things that they're doing that make them a failure as a partner to you. So how do you change this? Well, maybe you could start saying something like, we need to talk about what an incredible partner you are, and then sit down and list off all the amazing things that you love about your partner. If you do that a handful of times, I guarantee you the next time you say we need to talk, your partner is going to respond a lot more positively. Or maybe your partner has a dirty clothes problem. Maybe they just have a mountain of dirty clothes that just sits on the side of the bed. What do you think would happen if you just expressed gratitude for the sock that lands in the hamper and ignored the giant mountain of clothes? I know it sounds counterintuitive, but 
I really think you might be surprised by how your partner responds. Another thing that you could do is change how you bring things up or when you bring them up to your partner. If the first thing that your partner hears out of your mouth when you're reunited at the end of the day is, why isn't the lawn mowed or why isn't dinner ready? They're probably not going to receive it well. Maybe you can make an agreement that we're not going to talk about negative things or chores that need to be done until we each have had about 20 minutes to decompress from the day and spend some meaningful quality time together. You can also take a few minutes to think about your tone of voice, your body language, your facial expressions, the words that you choose, and see if maybe you can make some changes there to make your approach when you're talking about difficult things a little bit more palatable. So now I want you to just take a few minutes and brainstorm a couple of things that you could do to positively incentivize your partner to get more excited about or have a more positive response around the areas of conflict that you listed earlier in the video. As you test these things out, you might run into some nature issues. You might find some problems that are unchangeable, like trying to turn a lion into a kale eater. But you also might find a lot of the issues that are popping up in your relationship are completely solvable if you just adjust your approach a little bit. There really is something life-changing, something so powerful about the realization that when you change the way that you show up in your relationship, you can incentivize your partner to be their very best self. It's like gaining a superpower. And if you can learn to have fun with this, it can completely change the dynamics of your marriage. I would love to hear any of the ideas that you come up with during this video of things that you could do to influence your partner to be their very best self. Please leave them in the comments. And if you got something really valuable out of this video today, it would mean a lot to me if you would hit the subscribe button. And if you'd like my support in your marriage, there's some links down below of ways that you can work with me. Just go down at the description and check those out. Hope you have an amazing week and we'll see you on the next episode.